Welcome to 10 Talks, real conversations for champions with champions, where a champion life is a 10 life. Thank you for joining our team today. I'm Carlette Patterson, your head sports life coach at the Life Training Academy, and it's our desired outcome to share our passion for sports life coaching by training you to live a 10 life. You and your life matter. Let's get coached. Hi team, welcome to 10 Talks. We are excited to be able to let you listen in on some coaches conversation today. And we have the joy of having three of our head coaches. And Melissa is the coach at Auburn for women's golf. Sonia is the volleyball coach at Arizona State University. And Nicole is the head basketball coach at UC Riverside. Hi. So we're gonna get to hear everybody's introduction. We just wanna share team that our desired outcome, number one, is to express our gratitude for the first responders and everybody that is out there really doing the, the champion work that we know that has to be happening in this season that's happening in our world right now. And we are so for world well-being at this point. And that's really what is from our hearts and being able to share that with you. And we just wanted to, as we have this season that's so unique, to be able to bring together the people that are in our lives and, and learn from them and really hear what's on their hearts and what's on their mind. So we're going to start with introductions. I always think that's such a fun way is just to get to hear the power of each person's story. And then we're going to dive into really unpacking winning strategies and fears and failures and words of wisdom from our fabulous coaches. So Melissa, let's start with you. Tell us the power of your story. So you're gonna start with the old girl okay yep, go so, for it here we go <laughs> gosh my story um a lot of years in golf golf's been very very good to me um i grew up in tulsa oklahoma um played different sports growing up um, my mom and my dad both played golf and they were quite good and um, i actually really liked driving the golf cart that's kind of what got me hooked yeah. and, um, then my older sister kathy and i would play and I just really kind of took, took to golf and, and really enjoyed it. Um, probably started playing seriously, it's hard to say, when I was about 11 years old. Um, so it's, it's always been a big part of my life. My, I you know, went to University of Tulsa to play college golf where my mother was the head coach. <laughs> and so that's a whole story in itself. Um, then after, uh, after school, um, went on to play the, the LPGA tour uh, with a stop in Europe on the European tour. Um, so I got to travel the world uh, or play, travel Europe anyway. And then um, played the LPGA tour for 11 years. And then um, I knew it was the time to move on and um, left the tour, retired. And my mom thought that I would be a great coach. So my alma mater, University of Tulsa, the athletic director hired me with zero coaching experience. <laughs> Not recommended. Um, Not necessarily a winning strategy, huh? Yes, but I'm here at my mother's team. I tried to completely destroy it uh, immediately. Um, but I was at Tulsa for two years and then um, Arizona State uh, offered me a, a great position there. And um, so I, I took the job and left home and uh, 13 years at Arizona State had, had a lot of success, um, really had a lot of fun. And then uh, Auburn presented me with a challenge to come and help rebuild their program. And so um, we're in the process of that. And I'm in my fifth year here at Auburn and I've now coached for 20 years. It's hard to believe, it goes really fast. Well, Melissa, you're being very modest, which we totally respect, but it's, you know, tell us a little bit about the fun of you and your mom getting some amazing awards, being inducted into the Hall of Fame. I know that you have this beautiful list of credentials that, you know, we want to hear the juice of all those too. <laughs> um, I guess the juice is the, 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 the path to get to all those awards, um, but it's really, there's nothing better than being recognized by your peers. Um, but my mom and I have, I think we're the only mother-daughter team in our um, Women's Collegiate Golf Hall of Fame. As um, I've been inducted as a player and a coach, my mom was inducted as a coach. 
Um, we are both now in the Oklahoma Golf Hall of Fame. Um, I think that's another record, you know, so we're just, just following my mom. Mm. And, um, and then we were um, honored with a really big national award um, together. We were on the stage at the same time and um, just really amazing moments. So it's, you know, it, it's really something very special when your mom has had so much influence in your career and yet um you know, we both have so much respect for each other mm. and so we're, we're we're related but we're very different people <laughs> um, we've gone the same path of career but maybe a little bit different different way um but it's been uh no well, like i said golf's been really good to me Mm, that's beautiful. And team, Melissa is one of our certified sports life coaches, which is very fun to add that credential as well. So I have been Melissa's coach for maybe 10 years now and, uh, and as well as been able to coach her and her team. And then she got in and got certified as well as one of our coaches. So another great gift just to all the work that we've done. Okay, Sonia, so tell us the power of your story. Okay, so I grew up um, in a family of four. With the, um, I had a sister that's 15 months younger than me, and we grew up in a small town in Serbia, about 50,000 people, um, which is smaller than the university I work for right now. It's kind of crazy. But um, yeah, we had, you know, fun growing up in a small town where everybody knew everybody, you know, it was fun. And then we don't, in Serbia, it's kind of like we don't play a lot of sports. We just pick one. And if you're not good at that one, they just, you know, you turn out to be the sole girl that was never good at volleyball. So okay. <laughs> my story was a little bit different. I, you know, I uh, started playing when I was nine, fell in love with it. And um, my sister started playing too. So two of us together played for a long time. I played for 24 years. When I retired, I played for 24 years with, you know, my club team originally with national team. And then I ended up at University of Washington in Seattle. Um, that was year so that was super fun um, and then from there I went I played professional for seven seasons and then I started coaching um, my coaching jobs were somebody gave me a chance to be assistant coach at UTSA and um, I you know I didn't know at that time if I was really like up for this like, but I wasn't ready, ready to give up volleyball forever I knew that much I knew I'd, I, I could not like not have volleyball in my life. So I just didn't know what kind of capacity I wanted to have it in my life in. And then a lot of people that I played with, a lot of coaches that coached me, they had this like, you know, they would say this to me um, in different languages, like, oh, one day you're going to be a great coach. And I'd be like, what? I don't want to be a coach. I didn't go to college to be a coach. Come on. You know, like I would almost get offended, you know, kind of how dare you tell me I'm going to be a coach. And then, you know, when it was time to be, you know, to hang up my playing shoes and start doing something, you know, I was like, okay, well, let's try this volleyball thing and coaching. And I absolutely fell in love with it. I knew that was my calling from the day I started doing it. And, you know, I realized the power of impact that I can have on these people. I left my, my home when I was 16 years old and I went to the national, national training um, center for the national team. And, uh, you know, these people that had me since I was 16, you know, my mom and dad were not around. Um, they had a huge impact in my life. And, you know, I, I credit, besides my parents, I credit them a lot to who I've become as a person and, you know, continue growing and keeping them in my life constantly. And so I felt like it was my turn to give back mm -hmm. and my turn to, you know, in some shape or form impact these young ladies and help them navigate these four most important years of their life. And um, went from San Antonio where I was for two seasons. I went from there to University of Miami in Florida, uh, stayed there for two seasons, got here at um, Arizona State in 2015, 16, mm -hmm. 2016, and I was assistant coach of first year and then got head coaching job and I'm going into my fourth year as a head coach. So it's been fun. Very, very exciting to have you taking the lead at ASU and, and really bringing those girls into being the champions that they are just uh, personally, professionally, philanthropically. You know, I love your heart for really developing just who they are as a person as well as who they are as a volleyball player. Thank you. I am. Um, it's been, that's been kind of like, you know, my whole thing, even when I was playing, I would almost like, you know, I, no, I wouldn't, I would definitely get offended uh, when my friends would introduce me, Hey, this is Sonia and she's a professional volleyball player. I would, you know, I would have a timeout with them on the side. Hey, why did you do that? 
what, what do you mean? Why did you introduce me as a professional volleyball player? And they were like, well, that's what you, like, that's what you do. And I was like, exactly. That's what I do. That's not who I am. Mm. I don't go around introducing you. Hey, this is my friend and she's accountant. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, you know, I'm so much more than that. And it's like, that's a story that I tell my players too. I'm like, you are so much more than these four hours a day, you know? So we always talk about it and we've been really blessed to have you on our team starting this season. And you've helped me a lot with them realizing that that's the that's actually that the volleyball is not the only thing I want to teach them so no matter how many times I've said that it just comes a lot more powerful coming from you so. uh, well that can be my position which is fun you know that's the yeah. beauty of all of us playing our role playing a small role in something bigger than ourselves so great well thank you for that Nicole let's hear about your journey I know that you are starting a new position this season so it's fun to catch up with you as well so just take us through the power of your story power of my story um I think uh, a lot like you know the coaches you just spoke it, it starts with your family right mm -hmm. and it's just the foundation of who we are so um, I'm an only child. I got all my parents' attention, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I also had to, to keep myself busy. And, and I grew up uh, at a community center, basically, that my mom worked at. So, um, you know, just playing sports, being involved um, was just really powerful for me growing up. It was just so it was just what we did and what I did for fun. That was that was a recreation. And so it, it's just amazing how you know playing different sports. I grew up playing tennis. Um, also played basketball, just, just tried a lot of different things as a kid, um, just really shaped me. And it was just something I enjoyed. And I think, um, like most of us talking here, it's, you never expect that it will take you to the professional level. Um, lo and behold, that's, that's what it did. And I was very fortunate to have a college career and then go on and play in the WNBA for 11 seasons and play in Europe for 10 year uh, and that background just more than you know at the time as, as an athlete um, to then take this leadership position as a coach and so um, you know I had some doubts and, and had people mentors former coaches and of course my parents um, speak into me about coaching and say I think you'd be great at it try it you know I didn't see myself in this role and so you know seven years later doing something I absolutely love I love the women of this age and in being for them in, in a very um, you know, a time of change and transformation in their lives um, is, is really incredible. So I feel very honored to be a coach. You know, we, we get to touch people's lives in such an intimate way. And um, I don't know, I, I love what I do. And, and I think the power of it just comes, just comes from that family foundation and, and people speaking into to me that this is what I should do for my life. Well, that is really the power of our support team, really the people that love and care about us and that show up in our lives. And as coaches, you are making such an impact on so many people's lives. I think that is one of the huge gifts of just being able to have the influence and the ability to take somebody who has a passion for playing a sport and give them the opportunity to get an education and to really get coached up on how to be that champion in life as well. So team, we want to really know how do you know when to actually make that transition from being an athlete to choosing to being a coach and really what's the difference, what works, what doesn't work as much as you hear the beauty of these three coaches and how powerful they're doing it. It's not for everyone. And so just because you are a great athlete, we want you to celebrate being a great athlete, love every moment of it, enjoy it. And, and don't feel any obligation at all or pressure to come into coaching because it is very different. And that's what we want to talk about is really how do you make that change from being an athlete and it really being all about you and it being all about your performance and people devoted to you and making sure that you're set up for success for actually becoming that coach that is responsible now for helping the athlete become everything that that coach had the ability to do. So it's very fun to bring in Melissa, who's got lots of years in basically that transition mode coming right in to, even though I want to call them our new coaches, you can hear they have beautiful experience at doing it. We just really wanted to speak into the heart of that. So Melissa, we're going to dive in and ask you your winning strategies about as you watch your film and think about really all that you've learned. What are those winning strategies for our coaches to hear that's all about how to make sure it it's not about you anymore as an athlete and you really step into honoring the heart of the athlete. Uh, well, you said it, it is no longer about me. 
that was um, probably my most difficult transition because being a professional athlete and being an independent sport, like an individual sport, I mean, I didn't have anyone else to, to rely on or depend on except for me. And if I didn't take care of myself um, and my game and my agenda and everything that went into it, then I was going to get pretty, pretty beat up and walked over. And so I will never forget the first day that my new, I'm a new brand new coach, zero experience. My athletes come in and it was like, where's my golf bag? Where are my golf balls? Where's my uniforms? My uniform's too tight. You know, I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is that hit me smack in the face like a pie. It was like, it is no longer about you. And I was selfish, but I was conditioned that way. Mm. And so I think that that was part of my journey into transitioning into a coach and under, I really had to dig into myself. Mm. And I think that's why sport life coaching really struck a chord in my heart is that I really only knew how to do golf and from my perspective and I didn't really even ever think of anybody else's perspective mm. and I think that's probably the winning a winning strategy is that whatever worked for me in the way I did things doesn't necessarily and certainly doesn't work for everybody and I think that's been one of the greatest learning experiences is that there are so many different ways to get things done mm. and so many different people and their stories and their backgrounds. And I think that's the fascinating part of it is how to figure out, and I don't, I'm not always successful at it, but trying to figure out how to get the best out of somebody and trying to understand where did they come from? What, mm. you know, I mean, I'm a positive coach. I'm, you know, very reassuring and, and, and give positive feedback, but there's some kids that have come up with not such a positive environment and they really, they don't, they think they like it, but they don't respond. Mm. And so there's times I'll have to kind of get on them and, you know, that in golf, it just doesn't even seem like it fits, but I mean, that you just have to know where they came from and, and how they respond. So just knowing that, you know, how I did it, how I played, it doesn't really have a lot to do with, um, with, with my coaching them. Mm, great words of wisdom. So, Nicole, as you watch your film and you think about what you've learned going from, you know, being an athlete to going into the pros and then choosing to go in and really be that coach, tell us what your winning strategies are. Uh, well, Melissa struck on it. it. Lose your ego. You have to. It, you, you are there to serve, um, in, in our case, as, as college coaches, the, the student athletes. And so, you know, as a new coach, there were some things I knew, but a whole lot of things I didn't. And also working for a head coach and trying to, to find my niche and ways to serve uh, not just my student athletes, but my head coach and fellow assistant coaches. Um, you just find different ways to serve. Mm -hmm. And so coming in, finding out what that is, whether that's just assuring, um, in my case, it's just rebounding for kids, just getting in the gym with them and just knowing I was there to support them, that helped build trust, um, you know, just uh, having positive words, going on a walk with them, finding out how their day was, um, anything I could do um, to build a relationship with, with the student athletes and, and again, my fellow staff members and head coach and meet them where they were at, where they were comfortable, um, I thought was very helpful. So as I came in, uh, just fresh from playing, just trying to find a way to serve uh, different individuals in a place that they were comfortable, I, I found to be a winning strategy. Huge winning strategy. So we have, it's not about you and we have, how may I serve that athlete? You know, those are, that's the beginning of a great combination. And Sonia, tell us about really what you've learned as some winning strategies. For me, it was, um, I think there's a difference also of what I found for me being assistant coach and being a head coach. Mm -hmm. And um, when I transitioned into assistant coach and recruiting coordinator, it was such a natural role for me at that time. And to the point where um, I kind of like started understanding why people told me when I played with them that I was going to be a good coach because like I was that shoulder that, you know, people can relate to, like they can tell me things, they can, you know, they wanted to spend time with me and that was great you know I, I I had you know that was amazing so that to have be blessed to 
kind of for them to see me as that safe haven, like come to me and talk to me about anything. With that being said, um, it was hard for me to coaching just and understanding like why they don't why can't they understand that that was for me the hardest thing like okay I told her 10 times and she why can't she just do it you know and that was like super frustrating for me because those were the things for me that I felt like were so easy you know mm -hmm. and my boss at that time was, told me uh and, and you know I used to tell her like, well, it's a common sense <laughs> why can't you just get it? it's a common sense how long you played volleyball for and she would say okay I understand that she's the best player that we've ever going to have in the school, but she's also 20 yeah. and you have played volleyball for 20 plus years and she's just 20 years old. So my advice to you is moving forward, just assume that they don't know anything. Like even <laughs> if they're like the best player in the country, when you're coaching them, just assume they don't know. And that's helped a lot for me. You know, it's a, it, I just now don't assume, you know, even coming into Pac-12 and having some of the best players in the country, you know, in our conference and on my team. And I just don't assume. I give them feedback. I coach them up, tell them what I know and what I think they should do. And that's helped a lot. But the difference between assistant and a head coach, it's, you know, you're, you don't change the person as far as like who you are. And, but because you are the one writing in the lineup, you're the one that, you know, makes the decision who travels, who doesn't and all that. Suddenly, like, these kids don't even see you anymore as that person to go come to. And that for me was the hardest thing. You know, I'm like, hey, I'm still the same person. You know, I want to spend time with you. I needed that. And they were like, yeah, we're going to go to Emily. You know, <laughs> like, we have a different person. So um, I would say just, again, ego. Um, and it's not about me. It's about them. And, you know, whatever is that that they need, you know, I have to be able to provide for them. So instead of having a staff full of, you know, male coaches that they can't relate to or whatnot, no, I make sure that I have usually somebody with me that they can come to and talk to and, you know, be their person. So, Melissa, really speak into that. You hear Nicole and Tanya talk about just that transition, and I know that you've got plenty of film of just that human component of us wanting to be liked and wanting to win, and, you know, the stories go on and on from an emotional management perspective of just that deep desire to to kind of have it all and yet there is a transition from being the athlete to even you know if you were an assistant coach you had a different role to being the head coach and it's not always a great position to be in it can be really difficult and so share some words of wisdom for us oh, oh a lot of film on this um i am a people pleaser and I think everybody wants, you know, people to like me. And then I have, you know, as the head coach, you have to make some difficult decisions. You're, you're in a really powerful position. You can make decisions that are, you can make someone's day and you can break someone's day. Um, and, you know, when you have a team and not everybody gets to compete or start, um, someone's going to get, you know, people are going to get left behind. And it's just, you can't make everybody happy all the time. And I just because I didn't have any coaching experience as an assistant coach, I didn't have any experience with it. I didn't have any film with it. I didn't have any situations. You know, I just came in as the head coach. So when I first started at Tulsa, um, I did not have an assistant coach. So then when I, you know, I did everything myself. And then when I got to Arizona State, um, they, they told me I could hire an assistant. I'm like, oh, awesome, you know? But I didn't know as a head coach how to have an assistant coach. I mean, I was really having to learn everything just brand new. And what I did learn quickly with, you know, relate to what Sonia said as an assistant coach, the role of the assistant coach is very different than the head coach. And, um, you know, the relationships um, are very different. You know, it's like, like the student athletes, they know that whatever they say is going to get to the head, the head coach, but they just feel more supported. And, you know, the head coach, they always want the head coach to see them in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though they're struggling, they don't ever want the head coach to see them struggling. And I think the assistant coach sees that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just learning how to fill that role and be that role, but you know, it was, it just killed me. I mean, I was having a, such a hard time um, with disappointing people and being tough and being hard and making the hard decisions. I just, 
you know, I, again, because I was an athlete taking care of myself, I didn't, I wasn't really very well equipped to deal with a lot of these decisions that I had to make and how to deal with them emotionally. Um, so, you know, I, I think my growing up, my maturity started when I started coaching. <laughs> Can I ask Melissa a question? Absolutely. Kind of one of those deals? Awesome. So, you know, now that you've been a head coach with assistant coach for a long time, does that need to please people kind of go away or like, is it, is it change? Because I am the same in that sense. I want, I'm a people pleaser, but with the role that I have, I can't please everybody all the time. So how does that change? I don't think it, I mean, it's still there, but I think I've just learned to manage it better. And when I, when I got more grounded in my values and how to make decisions, if I make decisions based on my beliefs, then I can feel good about it. Um, it is, you know, like there, I mean, some of my players get pissed at me, you know, from time to time. I mean, we had that end of the year survey and I get it from my sport administrator. We go over it and we, we've had like the best year we've had. And some of the comments were just so hurtful. And I'm like, wow, I thought we were doing really good, but you know, so it's so, but then I take those things. I try to just become a better coach and remember that constructive criticism is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, anytime somebody tells you that you're not doing something well, it hurts, but isn't that what we're doing as coaches? Mm -hmm. You know, so we're having to, to correct and, 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 and change and, and, tell someone that they need to do better in this area and you're doing good here, but you need to do better there. I mean, that's, that's kind of the essence of what we do. So when we get, when we hear it from, you know, your sport administrator or feedback from a survey, you have to remember that that's what we're, we're doing and I'm still trying to become better myself. So um, yeah, I don't think it ever goes away. I mean, I'm, we are human <laughs> and we can't change who we are. We're still going to show up. But I do think that maturity and, and just understanding if I am making this de the best decision for my team, then I can live with it. Awesome. Well, at least I know it's not going to be a magic thing. It's going to happen. It's going to disappear. <laughs> oh, no. You know, it's, a, it's been something I've been kind of like, you know, I was telling Carlette, I, in practices, I would have like uh, those moments when, you know, in volleyball, and I'm sure for you, Nicole, you have like moments where you have like team practicing five and five and for us six and six. And, you know, and you're preparing, we're preparing to play against Stanford. And I need on the other side, somebody who can be somewhat like Stanford. And we put some boys in and then I have like a mom who wants to love on them here. And then I have a coach who wants to prepare the team here. Like it's kind of those two always bottling. So this one is like, oh, come on, look, she's so sad, put her in, she needs to be on the court, and then this one is going, well, no, you need to prepare the team for the weekend, what are you doing, like, you can't, you can't. so it's always constantly trying to, like, you know, manage those, and then, and then how do you manage this kid who didn't get what they wanted at the end of the practice, do you even address it, do you talk about it, I mean, I don't know. So words of wisdom, let's, let's talk to Nicole about that, and then Melissa, chime in on that, that's a great question. Yes, uh, it's the wisdom that's really challenging. Um, you know, again, team sport and, you know, even in golf where it, it, it's the individual part, you know, like tennis, but then you're still competing as a team. Um, the playing time issue, um, I think coaches have been faced with this dilemma since, since the beginning of time of, of athletics. Um, one thing I try to do, and I'm trying to continue to learn and grow in this, um, it, I, I think coming from a pro mentality, I had a, a much more clear understanding. I, I felt like that myself. Whoever's the best will play. Um, and in fact, if you're not good enough, you, you get a lower contract. And in fact, if you're still not even good enough at that point, you, you won't even make the team. You're cut. It, it was our livelihood. So I had a, a you know, very pro mentality of, of com competition and things being black and white. You know, it's just whoever is the best. Um, coming in and trying to transition uh, um, and balance those things, college athletes, because it's not pro. Um, yet, we are still trying to compete at the highest level, which is very competitive. 
Pac-12 volleyball is, is phenomenal. Um, it's just clear communication. This is the goal of the team. And even though I love each and every one of you the same, all of you are special, all of you are wonderful young women. At the end of the day, we're still trying to just put the best team forward. And, and I try to explain to our team and, and just continue to, to repeat this message of, this is my job. My job is try to, to try to put the best team out there that in my opinion, I think will excel. That's it. It's just basketball. It, it's not a um, you know, referendum on who you are as a person or anything. And, and even when it comes to certain scouts you know, and playing different lineups, that's something I do try to explain to our kids if I'm gonna end up playing somebody more. Listen, you came out only because it was a matchup issue or we're gonna go with this. And I, and I try to do that as transparent as I can. And there's still limitations to that. But I try to be as transparent as I can with the entire team all the time. This is this is my goal as your coach. Um, I love you. I want each of you to be successful on the court. We're going to continue to develop each of you. I want all of you to have success over your career. Um, but but this still is the ultimate goal. And college athletics is competitive. Mm -hmm. So everyone can't play. I've got a roster of twelve. I, I can't play twelve players every single game. So. Hopefully, you know, building a culture, and Carlette's been a, a huge help with this and explaining that and getting everybody to, to buy in and, and understand their value and role, even if it is not necessarily playing time or, you know, filling up the, the stat sheet. So, you know, trying to get them to understand the bigger picture, it's still about the team, it's about the experience of the team. Um, and, and you guys know you were phenomenal athletes. You don't remember all, the, all of your stats. What you do remember is winning. And, and, you know, especially in team sports, that's what we remember. I remember the big games we wanted. And so trying to get them to understand that as, as much as we can and, and uh, you know, repeating that message <laughs> over and over is something that, that I'm trying to do. And, and also, you guys, still, still growing it because it, it is challenging. Melissa, I want to speak to the heart of that. I mean, as, as great as these words of wisdom sound, I know each one of you can watch your film as an athlete and remember that you know, you, you were competitive, you wanted to be on the field or on the court or playing golf, you know, whatever your sport is, in our hearts, we feel like we deserve to be out there playing and that we deserve to be the best. And that anytime we're not getting playing time, we're not getting the opportunity to get better or to express ourselves or to be seen for next level. I mean, there's a whole lot of emotion going on inside every athlete. And the beautiful part about each one of you being an athlete before you were a coach is that you know that so well, and you have to take that as, and really transition it into being a coach and starting to see the world from a coach's eyes and also from the heart of an athlete. So Melissa, emotional management, how in the world do you do that? What, what works for you? Well, I think that something that the three of us share is that we um, we were very good athletes, and so I don't think we rode the bench very much. And so I think it's it probably it's something that I haven't had a lot of perspective on is you know not competing and not traveling. And so you know that I think that's probably a little bit hard for me. I would say that um, you know the one thing that is very good is that we have a ton of we are we have qualifying we have a score that you can compare against each other's. Where the other sports, you know, you don't really, you've got stats, but it doesn't really always tell the true story. Where, so ours is a little bit more um, objective rather than subjective. So it's a little easier for me to make um, some of those decisions, but, you know, I still pick, I always have coaches picks. And that's what you guys are doing all the time. You're doing coaches picks every single time. And so I'll have two qualify and, and, and pick three and sometimes they don't understand my picks and I also have to remember that I don't always have to explain myself um, that it's really kind of a life lesson that I'm teaching them as well is like I don't have to baby them I just need to give them the facts tell them many times that you know what you're you may not understand why I've made this decision but it is, it's just based on my experience. I feel like this is the right decision at this time. Um, you know, it's just, but I think what like Nicole, what your winning strategy is, which I completely agree with is laying a lot of things out in the very beginning in your culture and 
explaining what the expectations are, explaining that there's going to be highs and lows, explaining that we're trying to win championships and that not everybody's going to get playing time. But everyone's role is to continue to push each other and get better every single day. And so I think the more you blend that in your culture, it sets it up. It's like, you know, then you can ask them. Um, I always like to get things in their words, written in their words. So when I can come back and have a difficult meeting with them, I pull out their words and it's like, well, this is what you said you're going to do. Ha what have you done to accomplish this? Have you done this? Have you done this that you said you're going to do? Do you, you said you're going to do some extra workouts each week. Have you done that? Well, you know, so it's really powerful when you can get their words written down and then you can refer back to that. So just so I, I, I mean, so much of it is culture. Team, I hope that you are hearing just that as much fun as it sounds to be a head coach and as much joy as there is and as much of an honor as it is to really be able to, to earn that position of a head coach. I want you just to hear the heart of these amazing coaches and that every day their humanness is right there on the court with them or on the field with them and you know on the course with them. And they're really wrestling with a lot of the same choices and a lot of the same fears, failures, winning strategies that every one of us, whatever position or whatever career we're in, if we're an assistant coach, we want to be a champion as an assistant coach. And if we're a head coach, we want to, we want to please everyone. We want to really win that championship. We want every one of our players to feel like a champion themselves. And, and yet the truth is in life, things don't always work out like what we thought they were going to work out. Um, certainly, I know from my life, it's a much different story than what I envisioned. And yet, you know, there's a way to really take those failures and turn them into such a moment of learning that it's transformational for us developing into great people as well as just great athletes. So, Sonia, as you watch your film and you think about your failures or your fears, kind of share with us just what you've learned from that and, and the power of, of being able to own that and accept it. So now I'm going to go talk with Melissa. I did sit on the bench. I did ride the bench one year in my pro career. And um, it was a very humbling experience. Mm. It was my second year of being pro. And um, I learned really fast that I'm not going to sign a contract like that again. You know, I did what I had to do that year. And, you know, and I can always watch film on that and talk to the players that have that role on my team. Because there was a point where in that, in that season when I – you know, when I wanted to call my agent and say, get me out of here. Like, I'm, I didn't sign a contract. I mean, money was great, but I wasn't happy with writing a bench. So, but then I was like, I'm not a quitter. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. So it's like this, like, fight in my head. So I'm like, okay, so what can I do to do my job and do it well? And my coach literally sat me down. He said, listen, you're making, you know, half of what she's making. So she's going to play. I'm like, okay, fair enough. So your role is going to be, you're going to come in and you're going to serve and you're going to play back row defense, pretty much be a defense specialist. And um, I was like, really? Okay. So we're playing Champions League in Europe. And, you know, my job is to come in the fourth set after sitting on the bench for two hours to come in and serve a top spin. And, you know, first time I came in, you know, I you know, top spin, I put it in and I play defense and the other team just scored a point right away on us. And, he takes me out right away. He's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I served the ball. You told me to serve a top spin. And he said, you call that a serve? I said, um, that was a top spin. He said, so can you hit it harder? I said, maybe, but I wanted to put the serve, the first ball in. I didn't want to risk it and make a mistake. And he said, that's not your job. You need to rip it and put it in. And so that's when I realized, oh my God, he's not going to change the fact that I was sitting on the bench for two hours. You know, I need to get in and I need to rip the serve 65 miles an hour. And that's it. So instead of coming up with excuses, you know, and Nicole, we probably know this, you know, with teams in Europe, they usually hang out, have coffees and, you know, coffee in with some little shops nearby the gym or whatnot. You know, we would be hanging out and I was just like, I'll see you guys in a little bit and I'll just disappear. And they started like following me. They're like, where is she going? What's wrong with this weirdo? I would go to the gym and I would just take out a bucket of balls and I would serve 20 balls, get back to them. And I will just, and in my like street clothes too, like I wouldn't change or anything. And they thought I was a weirdo for doing that, but I'm like, I need to figure out the way how to do my job. And so 
I guess like, you know, for me, you know, we all have roles. Um, and for me, what's hard is communicating that to kids as a coach. What's hard is because, you know, sometimes they don't have the same, they don't have the same vision of what I think they, they, who they are and what I think their role is for the team. They don't agree or they don't want to accept that. And so I'm learning right now how, you know, you're going to either accept that role, you're not going to be on the team. You're going to have to go somewhere else. Like the year after that season was over, I signed a contract somewhere else because I didn't like my role on that team, but I wasn't going to quit on the team. So I think it's super important to be realistic as an athlete and um, as a coach to be clear, like this coach was clear with me, you know, like, look, you're making money to do this. And so, you know, these athletes, you know, they might not like it, but I'm, I'm struggling with like breaking their hearts in a sense, you know, like, or breaking it to them, you know, because a lot of these kids, when they come and play in Park 12, I mean, every single one of them was the best in their high school or one of the best in their high school or one of their best, the best in their club. And here they are right now, and they're just among the best, you know? So now it's what got you here. It's not going to get you to the next level. It's your work ethic. And it's all the stuff that, you know, you guys talked about. And, you know, so we try to do the same stuff, Melissa, you're talking about, hey, so what are some of the things you're going to do? And it's just that communication, their expectations, our expectations, that's been the hardest for me. You know, it's just, you know, as clear as I try to keep it and, you know, Carlette, you know me pretty well, but, you know, I'm pretty blunt as a, as a coach and, you know, I'll say it how I see it. And I don't know if that's a good thing, but again, we, there's a lot of, um, disconnect on expectations, their expectations and my expectations, I guess. So that's been the hardest for me, I guess, in this role at this level. So. Well, and the part about this team, I, I'm sure you're listening and thinking, you know, that you probably have some film on this in some fashion. And, and certainly this is really the power of communication because what somebody says, we hear it according to what we want to hear. And so as clear as a coach or a boss or a parent or even a partner is about describing their desired outcomes or their truth or really their expectations, we take it into that filter of us and we take it into the filter of really our desire and what we want to hear. And, and I'm going to challenge us. I know as we you know, step into our lives and we take the learning lessons that we've been able to hear from these great coaches, really honoring that, what is it that I'm really hearing from the person versus what do I wish I was hearing? And I think that's one thing that, that can be a true disconnect and it can, it can really hurt our hearts and our feelings and it can, it can make some, some relationships and some partnerships really not be as great as we want them to be because of the disappointment. And again, really that clarity. I love what Sonia said about going to her coach and saying, this is not the position that I wanted. I love that boldness and that courage to, to speak into it. And I'm going to challenge all of us to be able to speak our truth and then to receive the truth back from our boss or from our coach or whoever's telling us that whatever we speak that we want, we've got to hear from the person that's training us or coaching us or who is our boss. Okay, well, here's what you've got to do to be able to achieve that. And really being honest with ourselves, am I willing to do what they're telling me I want to do at the level that they're telling me I have to do it? Not being able to say, well, I did it, but I did it at my level. And so that's a big challenge. That's a big challenge to get those expectations aligned and, and be able to wrestle with that in my own heart and my own, you know, just ego and everything else that comes packed in my humanness of, am I really being represented as who I am and, and the image that I have of myself? So Nicole, as you watch your film and you think about the failures that you've had and the gifts that you've been given by both the wins and the losses, what are your thoughts about this? Oh boy. Uh, it, it's tough. Um, that, I mean, that is the heart of coaching, right? And, and then getting those expectations in line with everybody on your team who all has different roles. Um, work in progress, I am, so it, it's hard to, to offer thoughts on this. Again, um, the transparency, um, constant communication, which I'm, I'm still growing in, um, you know, I will watch film with kids um, because, and, and by the way, I, I went through experience in my pro career, I went from being an All-American and one of the top picks in the WNBA to getting DNPs, which means that did not play. 
and uh, it was very, very difficult to go through. And, and even throughout my career, I've been the starter, came off the bench, played a certain role. So I, I feel grateful to have been in all those shoes because I think it does help me relate to, to different kids as well as being injured, by the way, um, with serious injuries. So relating to kids on lots of different levels, student athletes. Um, but having to, to break that down and sometimes shatter the image that they do have of themselves, because it's true at this level, every single kid is the best wherever they've come from and they just haven't faced it yet. Mm -hmm. And they haven't faced being not the best. And, you know, I think in today's society with social media and whatnot, every, everybody across the board has been telling them that they're the best um, constantly. And so all of a sudden we're the coach who recruited them and believes in them, but at the same time is telling them, you've got to get better and here's what I'm seeing. So building trust, building those relationships, um, you know, it goes back to recruiting, um, you know, really building great relationships with the parents, I think getting their buy-in, um, you know, I think back to a situation this, this past season and, you know, I got her, her former coach on board and her parents on board to trust the process mm -hmm. because for all of us, th there's still a process to, to jump when you go from the high school level or junior college level or whatnot. And, and the same thing happens when you go on to the pros sometimes, there's just a transition period. Um, and, and just trying to set that expectation, um, continue to go back to it, um, also give positive feedback when there is growth, even though it may not sh uh, show to playing time necessarily, but to say, I see you, I see these specific things that you're doing better, um, to continue to keep kids in encouraged, I think is really important. Um, as a head coach and an assistant coach, by the way, when, when you see a kid who may not play this upcoming weekend, but to say, listen, we, we see that you had a great week of practice. It's not going unnoticed. Um, we see your effort. Um, just, just constantly um, that positive, encouraging feedback. And, and Melissa, I loved what you said too, um, the accountability factor of, well, here are the things that I think you need to do to find your process. So it's getting them extra shots, if it's getting in better shape, extra workouts, if it's your diet, if what, whatever the thing is that you're committed to doing, are you also doing the things because it's not enough just to, to have practice, right? right? We all know it if you wanna be great, it, it's, it takes a lot, a lot of hard work. So um, I don't know, Carlette, you guys, I, I love listening to what you're saying. Uh, communication over and over and over. And you know, sometimes like Sonia, you said, You've got to make tough decisions if there's not going to be the buy-in for that kid into your vision for them at some point the, the tough choice is to to move on somewhere else um, which sometimes is the very best option so team i want you to hear the courage that each one of these coaches are sharing from their heart that you know we are for everyone and even though it doesn't come off in that way sometimes because of hurt feelings or just, um, you know, ourselves letting ourselves down as an athlete, really thinking that we're coming in and we're this champion. What I really taken from this champion conversation is just the power that we have to be human, that compassion, that communication, all of these things are winning strategies to make sure that we're communicating with our boss, our coach. If you're a coach, communicating with your assistant coach and your players and, and just that, that courage to be your true self and to share that you do have a heart that is struggling with a decision, but that you are anchored in the fact that you have set a desired outcome or a goal and, and you're going to step into the position of leadership and really make the hard choices to do what it takes based on what you've been hired to do. And, and team, as you step out into your life and you take these words of wisdom from our fabulous coaches, I just want to encourage you to remember that it's the extra that really makes our life feel so different and show up so different. And if we're just kind of using this season that we're in right now with quarantine and it's so different from everything, our rituals and routines have been taken away, the joy, the passion, the, the things that really meant so much to us, they're really, they've been challenged. And this is a beautiful time for us to dig deep and discover more about us and, and to really anchor into who are we, what's important to us, honor those relationships, find that extra strength. And, and if you have a coach or a boss that, that this has really stimulated some interesting conversation, we want you to reach out to them, call them, talk to them. We've got some extra time to build relationships during this season. And you can hear that 
they are so for you, whether it doesn't feel that way or whatever's happening, the more that we can break down those walls or those performance barriers for communication, we can come together in such a beautiful way. So coaches, thank you so much for sharing your story, the power of your story, the power of your passion. And thank you for giving hope to not only our listeners, but the athletes that, that have the pleasure of being able to play for you and the many coaches that, that we're here to serve and support. So thank you. And team, go out and make it a 10 day, a 10 week and really live that 10 life. Thank you for listening. We'd like to get you coached up. So head over to iTunes and Spotify and hit subscribe. And remember, a champion life is a 10 life. You and your life matter. Create a life that you love. Give hope to others and be and choose nothing but 10s. Be you. The world needs you. Go to lifetrainingacademy.com to start your training and get coached.